Welcome back to Historical Context. Today, we're starting a new unit covering the colonization of New England. And today's episode predates Plymouth, which a lot of people think is the very beginning of New England. And Plymouth does represent historical significance to America. But there's some other events that occurred prior to Plymouth that I believe listeners would be interested in and should know. Now, if you've already been following the podcast, you'd know that today's episode does not represent the first time we've even talked about a colony in New England. In fact, there was a colony established, we discussed it back in episode 30, by Bartholomew Gosnold, who briefly settled the Massachusetts island of Cuttyhunk in 1602. In 1606, King James I granted a royal charter to the Virginia Company and a newly formed Plymouth Company to colonize the east coast of the United States. The Plymouth Company was chartered to colonize modern-day New England, while the Virginia Company was granted land to the south. While the land charters overlapped in modern-day New Jersey and Maryland, both companies could colonize those areas as long as their respective colonies were more than 100 miles apart from one another. If you'll recall in the previous unit on Jamestown, the reason for this split between the Plymouth Company and the Virginia Company was because the king wanted shareholders of each company to be from a certain geographic location in England. The Plymouth Company who we're covering today, had main investors that included Thomas Hannum, Raleigh Gilbert, William Parker, and George Popham. In August of 1606, a ship named Richard was dispatched to explore the New England coast, but it was intercepted and captured by Spanish ships coming up the Florida coast. So the Richard uh, did not have an opportunity on that voyage to possibly make history. Shortly after the Jamestown colonists left for England, two ships set out to explore the coast of Maine. Among the notable colonists on board were George Popham and Raleigh Gilbert. Raleigh Gilbert was the son of Sir Humphrey Gilbert, who you may remember from a previous broadcast, and obviously was named after Sir Walter Raleigh. A partial narrative of today's story, likely written by Raleigh Gilbert's navigator, did survive the test of time, and it is our source material for today's story. It's important to note that the two ships left at two different dates. One was May 1st and the other was June 1st of 1607. But other sources have indicated the ships left closer together, so we're not entirely sure. But whenever somebody in this era says two or three or four ships left together on a voyage, it may not necessarily mean they went at the same time. The partial narrative was written by a member of the second ship. The two ships were named the Gift of God and the Mary and John. Around August 1st, they landed somewhere near Halifax, Nova Scotia. They came into contact with some natives who wanted to trade. The natives offered them beaver skins, but the price was too high. The author notes that the natives likely have relations with the French because they had some French words in their vocabulary. And it's important to note at this point that we are decades removed from our 16th century explorers unit that we did. And it's likely that natives were often interacting with Europeans in this area by this point. The crew left the area on August 4th, and on August 13th, they arrived at the mouth of the modern-day Kennebec River, which is in the southern part of Maine. 
they spent a couple of days sailing up the river and they found it very pleasant. After exploring the area on August 18th, the group went ashore and, quote, made choice of a place for our plantation. And that would be August 18th, 1607, just months, if not weeks, after Jamestown, but 13 years prior to the Plymouth Colony. The next day, the journal also says they came ashore again and made choice of a place for the plantation. So they, they chose the specifics, but something different happened. Let's have a look. And there we had a sermon delivered unto us by our preacher. And after the sermon, our patent was read with the laws and the orders therein prescribed. And then we returned aboard our ships again. So they didn't quite just start building. They had a sermon, they read the patent, and then they went back to the ships. Reading the patent is eerily similar to me of our Columbus episode. In fact, it was the very first episode we did where they talk about reading a declaration when they landed upon shore. This just happened to be 115 years later. While it may seem they weren't too anxious to start, the next day, August 20th, they did begin building a fort. The fort would ultimately be named Fort St. George, after the patron saint of England. On August 21st, the journal notes that the colony's carpenters were to begin on a pinnace, or shallop, which is a ship. The next day, a group of colonists went back up river where they came into contact with some natives. So we have our first contact with natives on August 22nd, 1607. The natives informed them that some of the tribes in the region were in conflict with one another. It's good to know. Over the next several days, different groups would venture out to explore their surroundings, mostly by ship, while the remaining colonists worked on the fort. Some days, the entire colony worked on the fort. On September 5th, a group of native men, women, and children arrived at the colony, numbering around 40. So 40 natives show up. And they arrive in nine canoes. They had a friendly interaction and exchange with the colonists. Nothing of note that would be different than anything we've seen in our journey so far. The journal goes on to mention more focus being done at the fort as it seems the entire colony worked on the fort from September 16th to September 22nd. On September 26th, a group of natives revisited the colony. This ends up being the last entry in the journal, but we have other sources that we're going to pivot to shortly. Unlike Jamestown, it appears as if illness and death at this point in time were rather minimal, as they were not noted in the journals. Interestingly enough, William Strachey, a Jamestown colonist from 1609 to 1611, who wrote heavily on Jamestown, had a section in his writings entitled History of Travel into Virginia about Popham. And those writings start almost exactly when the last journal ended. In fact, it's only four days later on October 1st. Between October 3rd and October 6th, Strachey notes that there were several native visits to the area. On October 6th, the colony sent one of the ships, the Mary and John, back to England to notify England of their safe arrival and to get more supplies. The Strachey writing is a little more concise and quickly covers a large amount of time. It does state that after the Mary and John left, the fort was completed, 50 houses were built, a church and storehouse were constructed, and a ship named the Virginia had been framed. 
Over the winter, a lack of supplies began to take their toll on the colonists. We've seen this story before. George Popham, whose last name bears the colony, was among those who died over the winter. But, interestingly enough, he is the only known colonist to have died. Others perished, but were not named. Like Jamestown, a fire damaged the colony in the winter of 1607-1608, but the loss of life in the colony overall was much smaller than Jamestown. And you've got to consider that pretty impressive considering you're up in Maine. This is not easy territory. Despite the harsh winter, the colonists were able to finish the Virginia in the spring of 1608. That's the ship. It is the first known ship built by the English in the New World that had the capability of crossing the ocean. That's quite an accomplishment, and it's quite an accomplishment coming out of a place that's not very well known. Based on limited historical information, the measurements of the Virginia are estimated to be what follows. Uh, a displacement of 30 tons, measuring under 50 feet in length, a beam of 14 feet 6 inches, a flush main deck, and it drew about 6 feet 6 inches fully loaded. It also had a freeboard of less than 2 feet. This certainly is a vast improvement from the Narvaez expedition. And you can go back to the 16th century explorers unit to check that out. Those boats would have never crossed an ocean. Unfortunately for the colonist Sir John Popham, the financial backer of the colony and uncle of George, died in England over the same winter. Not much is known about the colony from the spring of 1608 to the fall, but when the Mary and John return in September of 1608, it bared the news that Raleigh Gilbert's brother had died and that he had inherited a large amount of land. So I want people to understand here that we have fast-forwarded an entire year and Popham is still there. This wasn't a blip on the map. This wasn't something that was established quickly and then destroyed by a foreign power. These people were there for over a year in Maine. At the same time, the Jamestown colony was just getting started. Raleigh Gilbert, having learned of his brother's death, decided to pursue his fortune in England and left the colony on the newly constructed Virginia. With no leadership to be found, it was decided that the colony would be abandoned a mere 14 months after its founding. While Popham was a blip on the English colonial history timeline, its production of the first ocean-faring ship named the Virginia is certainly noteworthy. The Virginia would go on to sail to Jamestown as part of the third supply and was the ship used to start the journey back to England when Jamestown was abandoned. That's right, episode 32 of our podcast. The last known use of the Virginia was in June of 1610 when it was sent to catch fish in the Chesapeake Bay. Nobody knows what happened to it after that. So Popham did not work out for the English. But that would not stop them from further exploring the region. Next time, we're going to learn about an individual who would likely become New England's most popular native. Next time on Historical Context. <laughs>